Hello. Eric. Yes. Aloha, my brother. It's Dave Lawrence at Hawaii Public Radio. Hello. How you doing? What's going on? So uh, it's Blue Oyster Cult, guitarist, keyboardist, co-lead vocalist Eric Bloom. They're Sunday at the Hawaii Theater and a thrill after so many years of being familiar with uh, their logo, name, and sound. And a big aloha, mahalo, and welcome, my brother. Thanks for doing this for us. Uh, we'll be very glad to be coming to your town soon. Awesome. Well, we appreciate you coming to our airwaves prior to that. And uh, I could be totally wrong, but Steve, the mystery emailer who sends us lots of historical stuff about groups like yourself, he leads me to believe it was 1999 that you were last here. Does that sound possibly accurate? Um, you know, I'm the worst person to ask. Okay. But, um, but uh, some guys remember everything. I remember something. That's cool. That's uh, not... I, I have some great memories of, of, uh, of playing uh, our 50th state. What are memories? And uh, What comes to mind? Um, well, I remember one time, you know, I used to do a, um, uh, ride a motorcycle on stage mm -hmm. uh, for many, many years. <laughs> and I remember one tour, we played outside, and it had just rained. And I went to... Um, a motorcycle rental place in the afternoon and got a Honda 750. I couldn't get a Harley. I don't know. What, I guess they didn't have one. <laughs> and and uh, got a Honda 750. And uh, we used it as the uh, gags for me to sort of, uh, we played Born to be Wild. And I got a Honda 750 and rode it out on stage. <laughs> and the stage was wet. And I put the kickstand down and the bike fell over on me. Oh, man. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't hurt or anything, but it was just kind of awkward. Yeah, right. It wasn't the bit you had <laughs> planned. I get it. <laughs> no, and uh, that's the only time ever in the history of me riding a bike out on stage, which I did for years, where where it flopped. I bet I know so, the year. Uh, that I think that was the 1980 show because I had Vinny Apice from Sabbath on years ago. And he had told me a lot about that Aloha Stadium show. We're talking to bring everyone in on the party that he's referring to. I believe it is August 31st, 1980. And BOC performed at the uh, summer blowout Aloha Stadium. It, it was part of your infamous black and no, blue. No, that, was, that wasn't Aloha Stadium. This was a um, um, an outdoor show in sort of like a, a, a shell type of place. Ah, they, be, it uh, was not that... Not that big a venue. Okay, maybe it was the Andrews Amphitheater, Manoa Campus, back in 79. Were you riding the bike? Yeah, and... that, yeah that's that's probably more like it. Okay. It was more of an intimate kind of place. Wow, yeah, you played there too, May 12th and 13th. Back then, tickets were so different, uh, Eric. Seven bucks well, in advance. Well, it was probably six bucks or yeah. something. Yeah, <laughs> it was really something. Uh, and uh, and then that one that I mentioned happened, and uh, then there were some more, and you, and you pointed out that uh, years are not your thing. Uh, but... But one of the cool things is you shared that memory, and obviously, thankfully, you weren't hurt. Any other ones that stick out over your long haul? Oh, yeah. I remember one show. Um, actually, we played indoors at some big club uh, way back in the day, and they had as a promotion um, an oyster eating contest. <laughs> And I and I and I and I it was the it was the night before we played and we came in a day early so we went down and they roped off a VIP area for us to sit in, and they and they had fans come in for an oyster eating contest, <laughs> and they dyed all the oysters blue, for the fans to eat. And that was and here. Some poor some poor soul ate like you know sixty clams or something like that. <laughs> And uh, he, I guess, to win free tickets or backstage passes or something. And I felt so bad for the kid who won because, you know, his stomach was sticking out like a basketball yeah. <laughs> after, after eating all these damn clams. And again, his face was all blue from eating these the dyed blue right. clams. Yeah, I remember that very well. Yeah. Well, who would forget? And that's a Hawaii memory then that sticks out sort of unique to any other kind of promotion, I'm imagining. They didn't do that elsewhere. Yeah, it was funny. <laughs> um, and uh, I remember the club had a, uh, I, there was like one main rock club in uh, Honolulu, Honolulu at the time. Gussie Lemoore's was, you played in May 99. That could have been what you're talking about because it was a club you're saying. No, it was way before that. Oh wow! Okay, well, I mean, who... yeah, it was a, it was before eighty five. Okay, wow. Okay, well, Steve's stuff just has those big 
uh, venues. And uh, and thinking about the one that I mentioned, again, that's probably the one that had your biggest audience in, in the state or maybe the one that came next after that. But take us back to that 1981, if you will, just because for, I think for a lot of music people, that tour, because it ended up being a movie and stuff, might have... Uh, uh, well, yeah. Well, if Vinny mentioned it, that was definitely the Black and Blue tour. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, it was BOC and Black Sabbath. Yep. And and what do you? Yeah, th- that was that was it. Uh, you know, we played that all over the place. Uh, we played many shows together. And uh, Vinny is uh, a, a friend, and uh, um, that was, of course, with uh, Ronnie Dio uh, fronting Black Sabbath at that time. Now, folks, that's funny you mentioned him. Now, folks, go to your webs, uh, your Wikipedia page, at least. According to your Wikipedia page, it says that you would list as major influences as it calls both James Brown and Ronnie James Dio. And thinking that he was on that bill, like you were saying, when you played at Aloha Stadium, explain when Ronnie first entered your life and, and any well, cool that, stories. Well, that's a too long a story to tell, but I'll give you like a brief thing. Now, I started playing in bar bands in college in upstate New York. Mm -hmm. Now, for your Honolulu uh, listeners, (laughs) that wouldn't relate very well. But but, uh, upstate New York, which is very far away from where we're speaking, Mm -hmm. um, um, was a hotbed of local um, bar bands and fraternity party type bands. Right. And I'm sure um, University of Hawaii you know, probably has local uh, fraternities and, and parties and stuff like that. And, and so, FYI, uh, just Eric, we get stories like this every single week, whether it's Roger Daltrey or Tony Iommi. So I, they're familiar with those references to Syracuse and Rochester. But go on. They're, they're not. It's not new yeah, to them all. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly so. And that was the exact turf where um, I started. Uh, I went to Hobart College, which is in Geneva, New York, which is midway between Syracuse and Rochester. Okay. Um, almost exactly. So, um, from 62 to 68, I played in bar bands. That's how I started playing. And one of the more recognizable and, um, more professional bands, uh, not really a college bar band, but, uh, the guy who was already making records and was a well-known guy in that, uh, genre back then was Ronnie Dio and the Prophets. Mm. And um, so I got to see Ronnie play in bars and fraternity parties and things like that. Like if I was getting 150 to 200 a night, Ronnie was getting double that or more. And he had a truck with a lift gate. <laughs> <laughs> and I was, put, I was putting my gear in the back of my 55 Chevy. Uh, that's a great visual. I love that. That's a great visual. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, you know, he had roadies, you know, I mean, uh, and we were carrying our own stuff and setting our stuff up and, you know, ourselves. And it's just a, a, a night and day difference. And and um, I remember one night in particular, which I, I've described before, but, um, you know, for your listeners, I would say this would be about 66 or so. Um, uh, Hobart had 10 fraternities. And like every other weekend, they would have a party weekend. And I was playing in, um, I can't remember the name of the fraternity, which is irrelevant now. And you would play four sets a night, normally like 45 minutes set or so, and then take a, a break. So I was, t- we took a break and we heard Ronnie was playing across the street. So um, that would be, I'm guessing, it was still Ronnie Dio and the Prophets. It might have been um, he had other names before he would, became really famous. So he's playing across the street, and we went over to watch Ronnie play. Now, the, if you could picture this, uh, a, a fraternity party in an old house <laughs> and in a living room. Uh, they cleared out all the furniture, and Ronnie's playing in the living room of this old house. And he's got a little riser, like with little feet on it, <laughs> you know, that like... Um, you know, like Glee Club, Glee Club risers. Right. And he's got a Sun Coliseum PA, which was a big, big, big. And he's got Marshall lamps and Standell lamps. He's a short and, guy, too. Really short, if people can yeah, picture. Yeah, well, Ronnie was not a tall guy. He not at all. That way. <laughs> and um, the other guy, um, uh, the reason it was called Elf and the Electric Elves 
and other names over the over the years was because him and uh, David Feinstein, who was the other guy up front with him, which was later in a band called the Rods, um, but they were both not tall, right. <laughs> and they were the two front guys, and uh, that, that's where those other names came from. Interesting. So um, they were short guys, and um, it later became um, a sidebar to the story. They later became Rainbow, but the, that's another story altogether. Yep. But but um, so, and I walked in, and what is Ronnie playing? He's playing the he's, pl- he's playing the beginning of Tommy. Wow. You know, and he's playing horn. Ronnie is the bass player in the band, which most people don't know. Ronnie played bass, and he's singing lead, and he's playing a horn, and then switch from the horn part to playing bass, and he's playing the whole first side of Tommy. Oh, my Lord. I'm going, I'm get out of here, you know? <laughs> I mean, we're playing, you know, it was so night and day better than anything I had seen, you know, like I was just playing regular tunes across the street, right. you know, and uh, with with, you know, $300 amps, and he's got like, you know, $10,000 worth of gear in this fraternity party, you know, and, you know, he's pretty inspirational, you know, plus he's got band clothes on, and, you know, we're just playing in whatever we could, you know, find in, in a trunk. But know? he's got that multifaceted talent you just told that story. What well, a great first of all, his voice, you know, I mean, there's no, nobody has to tell anybody about what a great singer Ronnie was, and he was just fantastic back then. Right, and you didn't no. even, and that's a great closer to it, because, you you know, you're talking about all this instrumentation no one would expect from him, bass, playing a horn, and uh yeah that's a well, great by picture. the time he was in black sabbath you know he, he wasn't playing he was just fronting the band right and uh, and most people you know of course then he went on to you know be a solo artist and and um you know was not a, a didn't play but he was a really good musician and uh, most people didn't know that and, and a big influence uh, on you too oh yeah absolutely he, i'm sure he inspired a lot of people but i knew him way back when you know, uh, I saw Ronnie Dio and the Prophets, then it, it evolved into the psychedelic era. I be, the band changed its name to the Electric Elves, and then it became um, uh, Elf. And then when uh, they opened for um, for Deep Purple, um, uh, Ronnie uh, joined forces with Richie Blackmore and became uh, Rainbow. Right. Now, when did you first get to know him yourself? I guess, what's a personal story that you would hold near and dear that people would find touching that you knew uh, about your own relationship? Perhaps the first time you met him and then the, 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 the most uh, endearing part of it. Well, it's funny because Ronnie didn't like to really schmooze about his upstate New York, uh, you know, upbringing and stuff. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, uh, but... Uh, we knew each other back then. As I wouldn't say we were competitors because he was like, you know, much, he was a local celebrity in upstate New York. But, uh, you know, we knew each other as, as competitors back in those days. And but, th- um, he was the big fish in the pond. And what about later, though? Like, by the time you guys played Aloha Stadium, what was your relationship with him like? Uh, how you doing? <laughs> okay. Yeah, you know, Nothing. just to say hi and, you know, talk about the, uh, a little bit about those upstate days, but, with, but uh, you know, he was friendly. With that great accent that you've got, I've got to believe, and considering your history, so one of the cool things about Eric is before BOC, before Blue Oyster Cult, and again, Blue Oyster Cult playing Sunday at the Hawaii Theater, before Blue Oyster Cult was one of the things of his many things he's done, is was soft white underbelly, and he's already got us in the late 60s era in these great stories, so you guys played, it says that late manager Sandy Perlman wanted you to change the name of the band after a bad review at a Fillmore East gig in 1969. So I guess I'm taking us to the Fillmore, Bill Graham. Obviously, Bill would present that same tour that came to Aloha Stadium. He'd present it at the Oakland Stadium uh, with Sabbath and yourselves. But over your life, how's, how any cool Bill Graham stories come to mind that I'm imagining you may have had a, a, a run in or two with him? Well, Bill was a wonderful man, um, and also probably the best rock promoter that's ever lived. Um, and uh, came to uh, you know a very unfortunate end. Um, you know, he came to America as a refugee, 
and and uh, just through dint of a, of his own uh, spirit and energy, you know, became the best promoter that the music business has ever seen. Um, he's one of those guys that was a self starter and moved to the west coast of the United States and started his own business. And yeah, but- um, however. You know, when we first started, uh, first album came out in '72. You know, I, you know, I don't think he knew much about us because he he really promoted that West Coast sound. Mm-hmm. You know, your Airplane and your, uh, you know, Quicksilver. You know, and all those kind of bands. And we were an East Coast band, and and um, it took a while for us to break into that West Coast uh, area. And he sort of had it all locked up. So we didn't play that area very much early on. So um, it took a while, maybe till our second or third album, before we started getting good shows in uh, the Northern California, which is where he was the main promoter. So when you did the soft uh, white underbelly at Fillmore East in '69, no interaction with Bill. You're saying at all? That was just uh, a... Bill was not there. Okay. Uh, he had. Um, we played Fillmore East on July 3rd, 1969, wow. and that was my first show. Wow. Oh, my Lord. In the, yeah. in the And who else was on the Wizard of, I'm imagining? It was people. Jeff Beck. The Jeff Beck group with Rod Stewart was the lead singer. And uh, Jethro Tull was the middle act, and we were the opening act. And that's your first concert ever, Eric. Yeah, we played a, like a private party before that, <laughs> okay. but but, but uh, that was my first gig. High fives, brother. That's a pretty impressive one. And and Jeff Beck, and as a guitar player, was he already somebody that you admired? And oh, what are you kidding? <laughs> I mean, it was pretty frightening. I bet. Um, I mean, we never played on a stage like that, and never had, um, you know. Uh, I went up to that mic. I'd gone to Fillmore as a fan right. you know, many times <laughs> yeah, right. and seen many other acts. <laughs> and and to actually walk up to that mic and go one two three testing one two three, you know, it was frightening. <laughs> That's a good one. And did you over your life? Because you've had this long career since then. Did you run into Jeff ever uh, again over your life and play? Because we get a lot of great Jeff Beck stories on the show. Oh yeah, yeah. I I, I met him and you know I'm not worthy of, you know a few times you know <laughs> but. Uh, um, haven't really played with. I think we played with them a couple of times over the years. But uh, oh, Beck Bokart and the Peace, yeah, right, right yeah. Uh, that... We did we did a whole tour with them. But um, you know, he's he's not not super outgoing. No, but, no, he's uh, not. <laughs> he's friendly enough. Yeah, there you go. We've had some great. We've had dynamite ones about Jeff uh, from all kinds of. And you know what's neat is on that note because they've come from a wide range of people from Joss Stone to Joe Satriani, and then I think of you. So among all the things you're connected to, let's throw in a, a totally different one that I only learned about more recently in studying the band, Patty Smith. Totally different kind of artist. Explain the story of getting linked to her, collaborations, and, and how that all began. Well, my goodness. Well, Sandy introduced us to Patty, I would say, before we even had a record contract. So that would be, I would say, 69 or 70. Mm-hmm. And um, I think he was sweet on her. <laughs> okay. Uh, she was dating... Um, this is like before we knew her. She was dating. Um, I'm having a senior moment now. <laughs> it's okay. Um, he was an actor. He just passed away a couple of years ago. Uh, um, hmm. Want to stop? Stop tape a second. You can look. Go for it. No way. No, never tape is nothing. We're 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 not even on the air. So you can take a second. You can look at something. You can think. We can. Um, oh, geez. He was a playwright, and he was in the movie The Good Stuff, The Right Stuff. The Right. Oh. Uh, um, Oh, uh, the right stuff. And he passed away more recently. Yeah, um, he was like a real macho kind of guy. Yeah, th- not... he, he was a he was a playwright, and he, he and an actor he though. He was an actor, not Patrick Swayze. No, no, no. Okay. Uh... Um. <laughs> well, it doesn't matter. We can as long unless he's a huge part of it. We can go over. This happens all the time. Well, it's more. an interesting story. Oh wait, well, I mean, you can do the story. Do we need him to? Uh, do you need me to look him up? I can Google it. What will What will be the Google that'll break it? Look up the movie The Right Stuff. He's one of the main actors. Cool. I got you. Hang tight. I'm blowing this thing up for us right now. And uh, 
Doop a doop a doop. He played that guy who was the experimental pilot in the right stuff. Okay, maybe I'll just use my phone since the uh, computer. Oh, no, okay, it's open. The right stuff. So we just need it's like it's Wikipedia page will do it. The right stuff. 1983 film. Uh, Wikipedia. I'll run you through the cast, and that'll get us. Uh, boop a doop a doop. Okay. Um. Right stuff. Well, that would be Sam Shepard, Fred Ward. Sam Dem Shepard. Sam Shepard. Got it. Okay. So Sham Sam Sam yeah. is our guy. So, so let's pick up the story again. Cool. So Sam uh, Shepard. Okay. So Patty had been dating Sam Shepard. Wow. And um, this is a late sixties. Yeah. So this is anecdotal now, um, uh, because I didn't. I never met him. So I guess before we knew Patty, she had been dating him. Wow. And Sandy, this is a, a quick, a quick uh, story. Um, uh, Sandy liked um, foreign cars, <laughs> so he had a, um, an Alfa Romeo. Oh wow! And uh, a, a four-seater um, uh, Alfa, an Alfa Ro, uh, Veloce GT, as I recall. Wow! And um, think about Sandy, though. Even though he liked those things. He was not a great driver, <laughs> and the more he talked, uh, the slower he drive. <laughs> it was almost like he, you know, he couldn't like rub his belly and pat his head at the same time. <laughs> now he he was a good guy, and very bright and very interesting, and did a lot for my career and a lot of other people's careers, but not a good driver. <laughs> so um, apparently, the what the anecdote was that he's driving Patty and Sam somewhere up First Avenue in Manhattan. And Sam, who is the, you know, uh, this actor, playwright, you know, and kind of a macho kind of guy, didn't like the way Sandy was driving. <laughs> he made him get out of his own car and took over. Oh. <laughs> didn't like the way he was driving. <laughs> you know, pull over. <laughs> and and he, you know, made Sandy stop driving and drove the car. That's a good one. Now, now, uh, on with the Patty. Well, it was Sam, uh, Sam, Patty, and Sandy in the car. Right. So, I guess after she stopped dating him, uh, Sandy actually told her he's the one that told her she should start a singing career. She didn't think she could sing, and um, wow. that's when she, Sandy, thought that she should maybe work with us. And that we should back her, oh my! Which never really came to fruition, right? Because we got our own deal. But there was some talk about that back in the day. What an unusual combo for many fans and their perception. Well, it may never have worked, right? But it was it was a, a thought back before we had a record deal. And were you guys like buds too, or was it all professional stuff? Well, yeah. Well, she was dating our keyboard player Alan. Okay. Wow. So there was a bit of a connection. And when we got our um, audition with Clive Davis, who was the president of Columbia Records, you know, she was in the uh, little small audience of about 10 uh, when we did the audition. And I was just going to, I mean, you're like almost kind of spooky, like you're looking at my paper or something. But Clive is a cat. We get a lot of great stories about whether it's Judy. I mean, so many people tell amazing Clive and he, you just kind of, you know, burst it a little bit. Explain how that happened. What you just said. How did you get to Clive and get that? And tell us about Clive in person, like what it was like. What, Clive Davis? Yeah, and, that, and the fact that you know, basically what he's saying here is is their big break for Columbia, and you'll, you'll correct if I'm, I'm my little summary for everyone, is that Blue Oyster Cult's big break that got them onto Columbia was they got to audition for this amazing, huge record mogul that we hear about a lot on the show, Clive Davis. And can you tell us that story and how that all came about? Well, I got, I got two quick stories about Clive Davis. Sure. Um, well... Uh, Murray Krugman, who has worked at Columbia Records, got us in the door. And he says, you have to do an audition for Clive. So um, we do this. Or he, he didn't want to come to a club. Uh, he wanted us to audition in the Columbia building, which was on 53rd Street and 6th Avenue in Manhattan. It, it was like a glossy, you know, all glass dark sort of a tinted black glass building in Manhattan 
but everybody had a nickname Black Rock. Right. Wow. So, so um, uh, we they cleared out a meeting room, <laughs> uh, like a long rectangular meeting room, in the twelfth floor of this uh, Columbia, uh, Columbia Records, and uh, just picture a typical meeting room with a long table. Like a conference. They took the table out. They right. took the chairs out, and um, a long rectangular room. And we set up along the short wall facing the other short wall. And uh, this is a room, a meeting room with like uh, fluorescent lights in the ceiling. <laughs> a lot and of atmosphere. We, you know, so we set up uh, like a, a small setup with smaller amps against one wall. And then against the other wall were about 10 chairs facing us, you know, about, I don't know, 25 feet away. Right. And um, they turned, the, they dimmed the lights, you know, just flipped a few switches. So we were sort of in uh, in the dark a little bit, and um, uh, uh, maybe ten chairs facing us. And um, Harry Nilsson was there, um, who's, uh, who's pretty famous and popular at that time. Yeah, and he just happened to be visiting that day in the building. Uh, Bobby Columbia was there. He was the um, drummer in Blood, Sweat, and Tears. Patty Smith, who is uh, Alan's girlfriend, and uh, Sandy Perlman, our manager, and um, other people from uh, uh, Columbia, the record department, the A and R department of Columbia Records, like three or four guys, Clive Davis, and uh, that was it. You know, eight or nine people. And they faced us, and then we walked in the room, sat down at uh, our gear, and stood up, actually, and, and played five songs. Now, about the third song, Harry Nilsson got up and left the room. <laughs> <laughs> so, I figured, you know, I mean, I'm singing, uh, you know, I think I, I sang every song, and... Um, I figure, oh, we must suck. <laughs> you know, Wilson just left the room. So, uh, but about the halfway through the fourth song, he came back in and sat down. So, uh, when the audition was over, everybody left. It was milling around, and Nilsson, uh, I went over to him because uh, you know I did a I'm not worthy kind of thing with him, yeah. and um, I said, why'd you why'd you leave the room? He says, I had to get a cigarette. <laughs> So, anyway, uh, Clive, um, Sandy walks back in and says, Clive likes you and he wants to sign you. So that was our big audition with Clive Davis. Now, the second story, let's move forward 40 plus years. Wow. Uh, the, there was um, his induction into the Long Island Music Hall of Fame, <laughs> which was maybe five years ago. Okay. So it was recent, you know, in the, uh, like, uh, 2019 or something like that, okay. so before COVID. And um, it's on Long Island uh, in a, a venue of some kind. I can't remember where it was. And I went because um, Blue Oyster Cult is already a member of the Long Island Rock, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Sure. So they invited me to come, and Clive was being inducted along with several other uh people associated with Long Island. And um, so Clive was sitting down having dinner, and I walked over to him, and I told him who I was. And he didn't, not only didn't he know who I was, he didn't remember doing the audition. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Says a lot about a busy career he had, huh? Yeah. I mean, it was just like went right over his head. Wow, that says a lot about, that's what I mean, this guy, to think that he didn't remember that, the kind of thing. Well, uh, he was sitting with Dion Warwick and right. a few other people, so it, it must have been, you know, like, I mean, he, he was polite. Sure. I mean, it wasn't like he blew me off or anything, right. but also he's probably uh, very senior. Sure, that's so, it. Uh, There's that, too, is what you're saying. Yeah. So, um, well, what a cool... Uh, 
you know, that is a heavy story. And we've had Dion on the show numerous times and hung, hung with her in the dressing room. And maybe even Clive was one of the ones that, uh, that she had. But that's great to hear uh, how that went and the, just the, the nature of having to do your first audition with people like that. And, of course, that spins off of, of the Patti Smith Association, which I think a lot of people who listen to Blue Oyster Cult would probably, especially if they know your songs by the radio, they wouldn't be associating you, you with Patty. Another cool thing that people might associate you with, though, that's a great story, I think, that connects to many, many folks, and, and uh, I bet you talk about it a bunch. When did you first become aware of the Saturday Night Live More Cowbell skit and talk a little bit about that entering your life, what it means to be kind of immortalized in such a, a, a way? Well, I became aware of it because I saw it live. Talk about it, the whole thing, how the whole story. Uh, I was sitting home, and uh, I had a rare Saturday night off, which is pretty rare for a, a musician. And um, there I am watching SNL, and they start off, you know, uh, behind the music, Blue Oyster Call. They go, what? You know? And um, <laughs> I was pretty shocking to see what are they going to do to us, you know? <laughs> And, um, they, you know, they never told anybody they were doing that to us. It was a total su you know, it was surprise. Complete, completely, uh, you know, we had no idea. And then there's uh, Will Farrell obviously playing me <laughs> um, um, with a shirt that's too small for him with his stomach sticking out. I said, well, oh, that's pretty funny. And, and uh, of course, it didn't, they, they got a lot of things wrong in that skit, you know, that, that, but, it's irrelevant what they got wrong, but but um, the, one of the main things they got wrong was uh, Bruce Dickinson, which is kind of funny. You know, they said the guy producing the, the the band is Bruce Dickinson. There is a Bruce Dickinson, and what they must have done is they sent a runner probably out. You know, we need a copy of Don't Fear the Reaper by Blue Oyster Cult. Go to a record store and buy it. So he came out, probably got a greatest hits, you know, and on the greatest hits, it's produced by Bruce Dickinson, who's a real person. So he is a remix engineer that works for Sony Records. Sony Records is what Columbia Records is now. And not the Iron Maiden singer, Bruce Dickinson. Obviously. No, not <laughs> that guy. Um, so there is a real Bruce Dickinson, but he's not the producer of Don't Feed the Reaper. Okay. Um, he is the guy who does the, you know, remastering, you know, that guy. Right, kind of right. Guy. Sure. So it says on that record, produced by Bruce Dickinson, uh, who is probably, you know, did the remastering, you know, 20 years ago or 15 years ago, whichever version they they bought at the record store. So he had a free ride so in the skit. That's, that's kind of funny. Yeah. Then right in the middle of it, you know, um, when the cowbell gets too loud and he gets annoyed, um, he looks over the guy dressed as Buck, and he says, "You really mean that, Eric?" So they don't know who's who, right. which is kind of funny. But I, you know, I can't really blame them for any any of that. They probably have no idea. Sure. But I think the guy playing Horatio Sands, the Horatio Sands playing Joe Bouchard, is it's kind of steals it. He's playing bass. He, he must have watched the video, and he nails Joe Bouchard, which is kind of funny. Oh boy! And the whole more. But Jimmy Fallon actually, but he's cracking up so bad through the whole thing. You know, it's it. That, I think some of the secrets of that is that the you know the the cast members of SNL are cracking up through the whole thing. That's what makes it so funny. Just too funny. And then it becomes this cultural thing. More cowbell that you just... Uh... Well, yeah, I think I think um, you, you can actually go online and get the see the actual script. Yep. And they're, they're, they're ad-libbing, you know, over the original script so much. And I think it's, um, it's mostly uh, Christopher Walken. He uh, ad-libbed a lot of lines, and I think they, they, he's killing those guys, the <laughs> SNL guys, and and they they don't know what to make of it, and they're just you know they're they're I think they're pissing in their pants, so they they they're just laughing their asses off, and that's all that squirming and laughing is what, really what makes like uh, you know you're going to be wearing gold diapers what <laughs> you know that I think they're it's 
too funny for them and they're just they just can't they can't stand it so it's a total shock you're watching it and it was just like what did you call somebody in the band and go you're not gonna are you watching us on now what was your uh no i didn't do that but but um you know it's 11 30 at night so I, I wasn't calling people right but but it was um you know obviously it, it, you, know, you know it's pretty long ago already sure you know it's over 20 years ago but but um over time, I think it's been voted number one. Oh, it's become a huge uh, part of the of both. It connects you to, like I said, it's part of how a lot of people know the band, uh, actually, who might be listening today, uh, quite frankly. Well, yeah, and, and it's kind of funny because, you know, people think uh, you're that cowbell band, you right. know, and, and it's, <laughs> Which is kind of funny because uh, we've been doing this over 50 years. Right. No, you have a huge... And people know us from the skit. That's exactly what I mean. I mean, that's exactly. That's weird how that... Uh... You know, I remember sitting in a pool. It was in 1983 and I was in Hilton Head Island in South Carolina. And this guy had this tattoo on his hand. And I remember saying to him, what is that thing on your hand? And he had it in between his thumb and his forefinger right on his hand. And I'll never forget that. And uh he said it's a symbol of a band, and I was like, "What band?" And he said, "Blue Oyster Cult." When did you guys come up with that interesting symbol that was so evocative? People tattooed it on themselves. Well, you know, it's also an interesting story. There's a guy named Bill Gawlik, G A W L I K. He went to Stony Brook with uh, Richard Meltzer and Sandy Perlman, okay. and um, he was a, an artist. And Perlman suggested that he be the guy to draw the first album cover. And we knew Bill also uh, because the the Stony Brook uh, scene is where we played some of our first shows mm -hmm. in and around Stony Brook University, which is uh, in East, Eastern Long Island. So um, we knew Bill and we had seen some of his artwork and we were fine with it. So uh, when he presented the artwork for the first album cover, he incorporated our, what became our logo in the artwork. So we so took one look at that and we said, yeah, absolutely. And it's been so, with you ever uh, since. It became, you know, indelibly etched as, uh, as uh, what became the Blue Oyster Cult logo. Yeah. And um, it's, it's there on every album cover somewhere. When was the first time you saw it tattooed on somebody? Oh, I uh, we all the way back. I, I couldn't tell you what the first time was. A long but, time you know, ago. I've seen I've seen several people who have it backwards, <laughs> and I never say a damn thing. <laughs> That's a. <laughs> oh, I say right on, man. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's a good one. That is a good one. All right, one final question because we're going to play the song as part of your bit. Uh, and as if blue, as if I mean that's the thing. You got these iconic tunes. So don't fear the reapers. One and it made it into SNL. Another one that didn't get a skit, but it's just such a great riff. So much fun every time you hear it. Who doesn't enjoy Godzilla? Can you tell the story of how that was conceived? Any cool or funny stories that make you laugh when you think of that great song, Godzilla? Well, you know, Buck wrote both those songs, and um, it's made him, uh, you know, a lot of money into the man he is today. <laughs> you know, so um, he, uh, we used to, you know, all live in one house back in the early days. We had a band house in Great Neck, New York, and and um, I think the first couple of years, you know, we had a band, and. Um, I think we all used to sit around and watch monster matinees and stuff like that. And, and uh, you know, it would be, you know, Frankenstein. Or, uh, also, we, 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 Don and I both grew up on uh, in the metropolitan area. And there used to be um, on ABC TV in New York, which was Channel 7, there was a, you know, every town had a ghoul that had a, his own, uh, had a monster TV show. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, almost every city around uh, America sort of caught on after a well, while, like Spanguli now, you know? So um, in New York, it was uh, a guy named uh, John Zachary had his own TV show on ABC at 1130 at night. Uh, it was uh, it was called um, Shock Theater. And Shock Theater 
uh, every Friday night, I think, or Saturday night at uh, 11.30, he would play with, uh, The Werewolf or Son of Dracula or, you know, all those kinds of movies. And uh, obviously Godzilla and all the Son of Godzilla and the Bride of Dracula, all that stuff was always played. And Don and I grew up with all that stuff uh, back in the day. And uh, we were always making monster movie references. Right, yeah. So when he he's explained that he wrote the music first and it's it was so heavy, he just came up with the idea that Godzilla would be a perfect fit for how heavy the music was. And that's how we got the idea. Unreal. And and ever fun playing it in uh, Japan ever? Is that ever a fun uh considering the reference points in the song? Well, we did play Japan, um, and and it's funny because we were, we were a little disappointed, at, you know, after, like, uh, Cheap Trick plays live at Budokan, and, you know, they became huge and famous uh, from that. And then we go to Japan, and on our way, we go, yeah, we're going to Japan, you know, we got Godzilla, you know? <laughs> and we get over there, and uh, no, it didn't quite happen for us. Oh, okay. <laughs> they didn't go, they didn't gobble that one up, well... No, and uh, I even I went to uh, uh, the Berlitz School of uh, Languages and took intense thirty hours of intensive Japanese, figuring I, I would uh, be, be able to uh, Converse. lay a little Japanese on the audience. Well, that's a funny funny anecdote though. Um, I spent some time with a local Japanese guy from the promoter before we hit the stage and. Learned a whole rap in Japanese after taking uh, 30 intensive hours. And um, so I'm doing this whole rap in Japanese. I can't remember which city it was. And, uh, and I'm saying in Japanese, you know, millions of years ago, before a man ever walked on the earth, there was huge reptilian creatures walking around. And the audience seems cool. They're into it. And I hear yelling out of the audience, hey, man, what's that in English? No. Oh! <laughs> Uh, you're just like they don't get it what can you do <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know you're in japan and you figure you know also some guy from uh the state some guy from arkansas in the audience but, that's great you know, what are you quite, saying didn't quite work out it's eric bloom and it's blue oyster cult he's fun and uh boy are their songs are fun too like the ones we've been talking about they're sunday at the hawaii theater and uh real pleasure going through a little bit of their hawaii history and also all these interesting connections over the years that you guys have had wishing you a safe trip and a healthy and happy visit again to make more memories here and i hope you've enjoyed being on the show today yeah absolutely We're looking forward to uh to uh, being out there and uh Catching some sunshine. Right on. It was great storytelling, man. Lots and lots of fun. And um and we appreciate it. So uh and thanks. Thanks for, for uh being a good sport in there. All right, come on down. I will. I'll, I'll I'll try to make it down for the show. I'm giving you a hug and a high five. I'm just great having you on the show, telling some fun stories. Made me smile. All right, good enough. Take care, brother. Bye bye. Aloha. <laughs>